thanks very much for the uh, invitation uh, to, to speak to you uh, this afternoon. And um, so I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about more basic uh, aspects of research. And if you do a, a search of the scientific literature using the terms 22Q11 and syndrome, there are over 1,700 papers. So I'm simply not uh, able to summarize that for you uh, in, in, in 15 minutes. So what I aim to do is to really give you a flavor of just some of the research and what its uh, implications might be. So the other thing I want to bear in mind is that you've been bombarded with a lot of information today, and so your ability to take in lots of information, some of which won't be immediately relevant to the uh, care um, that you give to your own children, I will uh, endeavor to keep things uh, brief. So this is a picture of the deleted uh, uh, chromosome uh, 22. And if I might generalize for a moment, the focus of the research that you've heard about so far is really clinical research. And that is asking the question, what effect does the deletion cause in the patient and what might we be able to do about that? And in contrast, what the basic science research question is, what does the deletion actually uh, make happen to give the child the joint syndrome? Okay? So, and that the, the information we get from those experiments may never be relevant for patient care. Of course, it could easily form the basis for the next generation of treatments. And as I'll try and demonstrate to you, if we're looking at fundamental biological events, then that information might be important for other uh, medical conditions. So at the most fundamental level, what the deletion does is to uh, create a, 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 a hole in one of the chromosomes. And the chromosomes carry the information that is required to build the organism from the sperm and egg, and then during life to maintain uh, that organism. And the code is really these four letters, A, T, C, and G, and that translates into instructions within the cell in the form of proteins. And so you'll have heard of these proteins, so one is a uh, protein keratin, which my head no longer makes enough of, and another uh, protein will be insulin that helps control the sugar in the blood, Another might be the, uh, a protein in the back of the eye that converts light into electrical signals so your brain can, can see stuff. So what's happening in the deletion is a number of these proteins are not made in a sufficient amount uh, for normal development. And I say development because, of course, um, the child is born with uh, Tijoid syndrome. So that means something is going wrong during embryogenesis. And so what we do as, as scientists is to look at all the genes in the region of chromosome 22 and ask the question, well, what happens if we remove them one by one or in little groups uh, during uh, development? Now, of course, we can't go playing around with human embryos to look at this. So what we tend to do is use model organisms, and particularly the mouse, which is a mammal, and looks uh, quite a lot uh, like uh, you know, a, a, a human, especially early in development. And so you may already have heard that this uh, gene, which is called TBX1 or TBOX1, is very important for the development of the, the major structural malformations that you get in the 22Q11 deletion syndrome. So by structural malformations, I mean the heart defects, the um, problems in the parathyroid gland, the problems in the thymus gland, and in the uh, palate, not uh, particularly uh, the uh, cognitive and behavioral aspects. So <clears throat> in, in the mouse, what we tend to do is use genetic engineering techniques so we can take away one or two copies of T-box 1. And what does T-box 1 uh, actually do? To understand that, as I say, we have to know something about development. And so this is a picture of a human embryo, and it's about four weeks old, which is about you know, mice uh, um, gestation or uh, in utero uh, length is a lot shorter. So this is equivalent to about 10 and a half days in a mouse. So a human pregnancy lasts nine months, a mouse will last uh, about three weeks. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, at four weeks, you can see that 
that you can vaguely uh, recognize a head end and a tail end. And uh, this little cleft here, that's going to be the eye, and this is the brain bulging out here. And these are called pharyngeal arches, and that they're present in a lot of vertebrates. And in fish, for instance, these will be retained as the gill structures of a fish. And in humans, they'll disappear, and they will help form the thymus gland, the parathyroid glands, and some of the structures that go to make up the heart, and the major blood vessels that come off the heart. And you can see these little things here that look like fins. These are actually, this is the forelimb, and this is the hind limb. Okay, so that's what a, a, an embryo really looks like. And this is a cartoon of the embryo, here with the head and these pharyngeal uh, arches here. So if we cut this embryo, slice it down here, and then turn it so it's facing you, basically what you see is that this uh, neck region of the embryo is formed of these multiple layers, which in the cartoon have been coloured in with these different colours. So there's a, this gap here in the middle is uh, like the, essentially the, the, the colour. So that's going to uh, go down and uh, into uh, the uh, gastrointestinal uh, tract. And each of these little bulges is supplied by uh, a, a, an artery on either side. And this is, as I say, a primitive configuration. And what happens in humans from four weeks to uh, um, 16 weeks is that these structures, some of them disappear, some of them get bigger, and end up forming um, the uh, uh, thymus parathyroid gland and the major blood vessels. So we can actually look at TBX1 and see what happens, what, what um, uh, uh, requirements are that for TBX1 during the, this process where this primitive structure becomes remodeled into the newborn baby structures. And we can ask which layers TBX1 is expressed in. And we can knock TBX1 out in each layer and look at the different effects that this might have uh, on uh, development. And what we find when we do this is that essentially TBX1 is like a master gene. What it's doing is helping these cells in these different areas to talk to each other and to instruct them as they move through the embryo. It's a quite a strange phenomenon. These cells are, uh, you know how in a, a, a cancer, sometimes you would have, a, there'll be a cancer in one tissue and then there'll be what's called a metastasis and can, those cancer cells will start growing somewhere else. And that's because the cells can move through the body. And that's a, obviously a pathological process that has to be treated. But during embryogenesis, very similar processes are actually very important in making a, 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 a normal uh, embryo. So that's what happens during embryogenesis. How does TBX1 control that? As I said, it's a, something of a master gene. So the DNA makes the proteins, as I've said, and TBX1 is itself a protein. And that protein, instead of being uh, say like insulin or keratin is something called the transcription factor and what that means is that it looks around, the protein will look around the genome, all the, um, all the other chromosomes and it's looking for a particular sequence of those four letters I was telling you about and when it finds them it sticks to the DNA and then it switches on other genes or switches them off or changes the level, you know, to from uh, like a dimmer switch on the on the side of the wall, so you can have a high level of a gene expression or a low level of a gene expression. So when you have the deletion and you don't have enough TBX1, you affect the level of protein for uh, hundreds of other uh, 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 you affect hundreds of other proteins, which affect many different processes during this uh, embryo embryological period. So as I've said, critical to uh, these events, these remodeling events, are cells talking to each other. And how do cells talk to each other? So this is a, a, just a cartoon of a couple of cells. And here's the nucleus where the chromosomes will sit in, inside here. And the chromosomes will, will uh, send messages to tell the cell to make the proteins that are going to do the talking. And the transmitting cell will throw out some proteins and those will diffuse through the body fluids and they will uh, be detected by receptors on the receiving cell or the target cell. And so this cell is telling this cell what to do and where to go. 
So what we do with TBX1 is, as I've mentioned, what it, uh, it controls the expression of different target genes, and we can look at all these target genes in one go in the laboratory. And then we can look at their names, and they've always got these highly memorable uh, um, uh, nomenclatures like CXCL12, and then we know from other people's research, well, maybe that gene's going to be important in the uh, uh, formation of the structures that are affected in the syndrome. So TBX1 will control the level of some molecules that do this signaling uh, between uh, different cells. So if we look at CXCL12, as I've said, a transmitting cell or a source will throw out the signal and that will then bind to the receptors on a receiving cell and then the receptors will transmit a signal through the cell and that in turn will then alter the expression of a whole load of other genes. And in the case of CXCL12, what its major effect is, is to say, okay, so here's some CXCL12, it's up on the top right of the slide, so it binds to these receptors, that's the direction the cell has to move in. So it affects something called migration. And this, I mentioned to you earlier, controlling the processes of the way the cells move through the embryo as it remodels from the primitive fish-like configuration to the newborn baby is vital uh, for formation of the structures that are affected in 22Q11 deletion syndrome. So what happens if you knock out CXCL12? If it's likely to be important in uh, the pathway that TBX1 controls, then one might expect to see similar defects in mice that don't have CXCL12. And when you uh, knock CXCL12 out, you get a hole in the heart, sometimes called a ventricular septal defect. And as you may already know, that is one of the heart defects that you see in the 22Q11 division syndrome. So to show you this in more detail, this is what we call a tissue section through a heart. It's uh, perhaps um, 10 to the uh, minus five meters. So uh, it'll be a hundredth of a, a millimeter uh, in, in, in uh, depth. And here we've got the right ventricular wall. And here's the, the, what we call the septum. So this is separating the left ventricle from uh, the right ventricle. And it's completely separated by this wall here. Sorry that the point is fading. And, and when you've got the right-hand side green arrow, you can see this gap, and that's the hole uh, in the heart. Now, as you know, a, 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 a BSD itself is not usually sufficient to um, cause lethality uh, in a human being, and it's not sufficient to cause lethality in a mouse either. So, we realize that there must be more to CXCL12 than just holes in the heart, because if you're not CXCL12 out, the mice die. And of course, the heart is a muscle. It's a sort of different type of muscle than the ones you've got in the leg. But it's uh, obviously required as a muscle to do the hard work of pumping the blood around the body. And as a muscle, it needs its own blood supply. It needs its own oxygen. And when you knock out CXCL12, the other thing you see is a defect in the blood vessels that will take the oxygen to the heart. So here you can see a heart, a CXCL12 normal mouse, and it's being stained with an, a, um, a, an antibody so that you can track the coronary artery, which is labeled here with the little arrow, and you can see it's coming. This is where the main vessel aorta is leaving the left ventricle, and you can see it tracked down all the way to the bottom of the heart, supplying oxygen and blood to uh, uh, the, 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 the heart muscle that's going to pump. And in both the knockout of the um, transmitting protein, CXCL12, and indeed the receptor for CXCL12, which happens called CXCL4, in neither of those cases do you get a coronary artery, and that's why um, the, uh, uh, this, this might start. So one thing you will be glad, <coughs> glad to know about is we have absolutely uh, no uh, evidence that having the deletion, having missing one copy of TBX1, has any effect on the coronary arteries. So I'm not going to add to the, uh, the long list of concerns uh, that you may have. 
But instead, what I will do is go back to something I mentioned uh, when I started, is what use, what possible relevance could some of this research have, maybe out with uh, 22QR1 deletion syndrome as well, uh, uh, um, itself. And so you'll know that the coronary arteries are very important in adult life. Um, um, you know, by your uh, late teens, early 20s, and certainly by my age, you'll be developing these things called plaques in your coronary arteries that narrow them. And obviously this is bad because if it completely blocks off, you will have a heart attack, which is essentially dead muscle, which ain't going to pump the blood very well at all. And as well as dead muscle, you'll be missing the coronary arteries. So one possibility that's going to be tested is whether using uh, uh, molecules such as CXCR4, we will be able to educate the heart to rebuild the coronary artery system after uh, a, a, a heart uh, attack. So in other words, what we're trying to do is to learn enough about how the body generates its pattern and generates its structures to uh, be able to utilize that information in working out how the uh, body can regenerate itself. So the work that's following on from work on the syndrome may be of more uh, general relevance. And just, just to mention that while I've concentrated on blood vessels, the same molecules, the same proteins, affect migration of neurons in the brain and may be uh, responsible for some of the behavioral defects, but there isn't time to go into that. So to summarize, the clinical research that we focused on today is of direct relevance. Uh, in, in, in English, we have this uh, term, jam tomorrow, which is really what I'm promising you uh, from the basic research. It forms the foundation of what we will do in the future. And I've given you a little bit of an insight into how basic research may help with other diseases. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that with you.